So good afternoon. Today I'd like to provide another update around testing, tracing, hospitalizations, PPE distribution, and the ongoing work of the reopening advisory board. I also want to give a brief update on federal disaster assistance. On testing, yesterday the Commonwealth processed 11,118 tests. We had 1,963 confirmed positive tests of COVID-19, which means about 17.7 percent of the tests conducted were positive. This positive percentage is an important piece of the data that we monitor, and that latest number of 17 percent is down from a previous high that was much closer to 30 percent, which is a good sign because we test a lot more than we did a few weeks ago, and we've also tried to test in places where we were particularly concerned about the potential um, of community and, and organizational spread. As I've mentioned, we continue to hold daily calls with leaders in the healthcare community and have been closely monitoring hospital capacity and hospitalization rates related to COVID-19 and other non-COVID-related issues throughout the state. As of yesterday, there were 3,856 patients hospitalized in Massachusetts for COVID-19, which is quite consistent with our data of the past few days, uh, meaning that hospitalization rates for COVID-19 uh, have been pretty flat now for about 15 days in a row. The percentage of all cases that are hospitalized has also been pretty consistent. It's at around 6%. While we're watching for that downward trend that many people talk about, uh, not just here, but in many other places with respect to monitoring and measuring the uh, spread of the disease, the number of people needing hospital care here in the Commonwealth has stayed pretty consistent, as I said, for the better part of the past two weeks. Flip side of that was we haven't seen an increase. Um, for about two weeks as well, which is also a good thing. We also suffered yesterday, uh, I think many people know, the longest sing largest single uh, day increase of COVID-19 related deaths here in Massachusetts, losing 252 people to this insidious virus. We obviously track a lot of numbers to understand the presence and the traje trajectory of this pandemic, uh, but the lives lost every day is one of those numbers um, that none of us is ever going to get particularly comfortable with. Behind those numbers, as I've said before, are people and families and lives that have been forever changed by the lethal grip of COVID-19, and, and our hearts go out to everyone who's lost someone to this terrible virus. Finally, we continue to chase every avenue that's available to us with respect to PPE for healthcare workers and frontline workers. As of yesterday, we've delivered over 7 million pieces, including masks, gowns, and ventilators. With respect to contact tracing, I think most people know that earlier this month, we announced the creation of a COVID-19 community tracing collaborative in collaboration with the folks at Partners in Health to mitigate the spread of the disease and to contain it here in Massachusetts. We're the first state in the nation to launch this sort of a program, and we're fortunate to have a partner in this, like Partners in Health on Board, an organization that has done this issue fighting diseases and outbreaks uh, in many developing countries and has battled Ebola and Zika and many other um, contagions uh, in many parts of the world. And they have proven time and time again that their model can work, and in many cases in places that are far more challenging uh, than they would be here in Massachusetts. We believe this tracing program is a key element toward not only stopping the spread, but also understanding where the virus is, who's been affected, and how we can go about making sure uh, that we contain it. We launched this program earlier this month and said that by the end of April, we anticipated we would have about 1,000 people on board working on this particular initiative. Um, that is just about the number of people we have working so far and to have stood up an organization uh, in that period of time uh, on a joint basis with Partners in Health was a terrific piece of work, but now obviously the really tough stuff begins, which is making sure we do all the stuff we need to do and that they need to do to both identify people who test positive, support them uh, in isolation, make sure we connect to their close contacts and do what we can to support them as well. This team is now supported, by the way, by 80 local boards of health who have stepped up to work alongside and to help the initiative. And to date, this team, uh, in a fairly short period of time where they've been hiring and, and setting up their call center operations, has made contact with about 5,000 people who are either 
COVID-19 positive or suspected uh, to be close contacts of people who were. Tracing, is, as we've said before, is all about identifying and reaching out to the people that someone with COVID-19 has been in contact with. Our tracers can then tell those folks to monitor for symptoms and to self-isolate to prevent any further spread. Infectious disease specialists now believe this virus can go undetected for days, and some people who test positive actually never show any symptoms at all. Originally, when we first started putting this together, we projected that a person would have around 10 contacts that would then need to be contacted. So far, the average number of contacts is actually only two. That's a very good sign because it means that the work all of you and we have done here in Massachusetts to stay home, uh, to separate, to socially distance, uh, and to take seriously this idea that all of us have a role to play in reducing the spread has made a big difference. And if you check out the mobility data that's popped up by Google and others with respect to how much uh, people have been moving around since the sort of middle to end of March, uh, the Massachusetts numbers track as well as any other uh, region um, of the country. And that, again, is a good sign because it means the stuff that we've put in place, um, the work that you have done uh, to socially distance, limit your travel, um, and limit the number of people you've come in contact with has had exactly the kind of impact on the rate of spread and the rate of growth in the disease here in Massachusetts that we hoped it would. With respect to this collaborative, if you receive a call from the collaborative, please take the call and provide the relevant information to the caller. What's been interesting about this from the beginning uh, is as people have started calling folks who tested positive for COVID, the conversations have not just been about uh, their close contacts. The conversations have been about what are the sorts of things that they and we need to do to help them isolate and to support them as they go through the process of dealing with the fact that they've tested positive and may or may not have already started to show symptoms. And that outreach that we make to them, which is then followed by outreach to their close contacts, is in many respects about providing them with guidance and support. And the calls have actually lasted longer than people originally anticipated they would because folks who are in this situation had a lot on their mind and really appreciated the fans the chance to have a chance to talk to somebody about what their concerns were, what their questions were, and how those uh, concerns and questions could be addressed um, by the Commonwealth and by the folks at Partners in Health. The phone calls that you would get, if you were to get one, would come from an 833 or an 857 number, and your phone, if you have caller ID, would say, MA COVID team. And the other reason why it would be important for you to take this call is it does mean somebody you've been in close contact with has tested positive, and we think it's really important for you to know uh, what that means for you and how we can help you make sure that you aren't then somebody who ends up spreading uh, the virus to somebody else. If you see MA COVID team come up on your phone, please pick it up. It's good for you, it's good for whoever it was that recommended we called you, and it's going to be good for the people that you're in contact with uh, on a regular basis as well. This is, frankly, your chance to be part of the fight to both contain and push back against the spread and the virus. With respect to reopening, um, which is certainly something that I think is at the forefront of everybody's mind, including ours, uh, the advisory board led by Lieutenant Governor Polito and Secretary Keneally has hit the ground running and has begun meeting with various employers, business organizations, and municipalities to talk to them about what some of their issues are and how they see this uh, potentially working for them. Their goal, obviously, is to hear from employers from across the Commonwealth, uh, from trade unions, from frontline workers, and from others to gather as much data as they possibly can and to work with the folks at the Department of Public Health and in the healthcare community to make sure that we can offer up specific guidance uh, to those who would like to find a way to reopen and then to hear from them about how that guidance might translate into what their day-to-day would look like on the ground inside their organization. The goal here is to try to make sure that as many voices as possible can be heard. They're setting up feedback and listening sessions across the state. 
Um, and as of Wednesday, they've talked to retailers, uh, folks in the biotech industry, folks in the healthcare industry, folks in the technology industry, and obviously those brick and mortar retailers in particular have been very hard hit, and they are of particular interest, not surprisingly, to a lot of our colleagues in municipal government, because they do, in many cases, make up a lot of the Main Street activity uh, that vibrant downtowns here in Massachusetts are all about. And this work is obviously going to be critical to our ability to make sure that a smart and planned phase reopening can take place here in Massachusetts. And we're glad that so many people are already stepping up, reaching out, and seeking to engage with the advisory board uh, on what some of their ideas and proposals are with respect to how to safely uh, resume operations. The team obviously has a tremendous amount of work to do in a very short period of time, um, but I'm looking forward to having an opportunity to present both short-term and uh, medium and, and final report findings from the group as they move forward. We also just want to let you know that today we did submit a request to FEMA for the agency to provide 100% reimbursement for eligible costs under the Federal Disaster Declaration that we filed for and got approved by the President uh, several weeks ago. Currently, Massachusetts expects to absorb about 25% of those costs with about 75% reimbursed by the federal government. To date, we've already incurred several costs, many costs actually, for responding to the pandemic talking just about PPE, some of the alternative care sites we've set up, and the deployment of the National Guard on, on its mobile testing program. We obviously appreciate the support uh, and the guidance we've gotten from FEMA over the course of the past several weeks, um, and look forward to them reviewing our latest request. Let me just close by saying this. I think we all know tomorrow's May 1st. Um, and it's a slightly different kind of May 1st than the one we've had typically over the course of the past few years. Uh, April, obviously, was a very long and very hard month, um, followed by or preceded by the month of March, which many people felt the same way about. Uh, I think what I would say to everybody is, uh, while these are challenging and difficult times, um, we have, in fact, uh, bent the curve. We did, in fact, reduce the spread. We are now living with a plateau that I'm sure all of us would like to see dip a little bit so that we can move a little more quickly with respect to what a reopening strategy would look like. But we've now got a smart group of people who are getting together literally for hours on hours every single day to talk to their colleagues here in Massachusetts about what smart policies and procedures would look like with respect to that. And we're obviously looking forward to having a chance to discuss those options and opportunities with all of you at some point down the road. We do continue to talk on a regular basis with our colleagues uh, around the Northeast region. Many of them are wrestling with the same kinds of questions uh, and issues that we are here in Massachusetts. Uh, in some respects, those conversations are reassuring because it's pretty clear that they're thinking about and talking about a lot of the same things we are. But I think all of us uh, understand and appreciate the fact that the best way to handle the reopening on this is to make sure we do it in a way that's consistent with the data and the recommendations that have come from uh, virtually every level of government uh, and every country with respect to when it's appropriate to reopen, to make sure that we op reopen when the time is right. We do it in a way that is safe and will be successful and that we don't create a scenario in which this virus comes back at some point down the road. And with that, I will turn it over to Secretary Sutters. Thank you, Governor, Lieutenant Governor. Good afternoon. I'm just going to pick up a theme as the Governor talked about May. So May is Mental Health Month. As a social worker, former Commissioner of Mental Health, and as a family member who's experienced the impact of mental illness on my family, it's important to be aware of our personal mental health during this pandemic. I want to remind all of us that it's reasonable to feel anxiety and stress right now. Fear and anxiety about a disease, a pandemic, can be overwhelming and cause strong emotions in adults and children, in all of us. COVID-19, as we all know, has affected our daily life, and it can affect both our physical and mental health. From loneliness and situational depression, 
resulting from isolation, anxiety from the fear of contagion, grief from loss, to worrying about economic security. These are all real and can affect our mental well-being and that of our loved ones. Nearly half of Americans report that the coronavirus has had a negative impact on their mental health, as reported in an issue paper by the Kaiser Family Foundation in April. If you or someone you care about, if you are feeling overwhelmed or if someone you care about is feeling overwhelmed with emotions like sadness or anxiety, there are resources out there. You can call to talk, C-A-L-L to talk is a resource available through our 2 on one line. In March, which may seem like a long time ago to all of us, we launched in the Commonwealth the Massachusetts Network of Care, a searchable behavioral health directory of services and organizations to preserve and protect your mental health. The website connects Massachusetts residents with information about mental health and behavioral health services and treatment in your communities, including more than 5,000 organizations. It's searchable by keywords and zip codes. The website is managed by the Massachusetts Association for Mental Health and supported by the Blue Cross Blue Shield Foundation, the CF Adams Charitable Trust, and the Metro West Health Foundation. The website is massachusetts.networkofcare.org. It can also be accessed through the mass.gov website. Some other tips. It's important to take care of yourself, your friends, and your family. And it's difficult to take care of others if you aren't kind to yourself. And no offense to my friends in the media, but take breaks from watching, reading, or listen, listening to news stories, including social media. Hearing or reading constantly about the pandemic repeatedly can be upsetting. It's okay to turn things off. Take care of your body. Take deep breaths, stretch, meditate, whatever helps you sort of calm down. Try to eat healthy, well-balanced meals, exercise, get plenty of sleep, and avoid excessive alcohol and drugs. It's okay to take a walk or sit outside in good weather, perhaps not today. It's important to take time to unwind. Try to engage in some activities that have been important to you. Connect with others. Connection is what we're about. Talk with people you trust about your concerns and how you're feeling. And call your health care provider if stress gets in the way of how you're feeling about how you get through your daily life. It's very important as we get through this pandemic that we need to take care of ourselves, both mentally and physically. Thank you. For that, Governor? So I'm going to put a PS on that. Um, I've tried for years to get my three kids to read books, wildly un unsuccessfully. And, uh, and my daughter um, and a friend of hers decided to create a book club because it would give the two of them plus a number of their friends a reason to chat every night and something to talk about. Um, and they have now been <laughs> reading books for a couple of weeks, talking every single night about what they're reading in the books that they've got. They even asked me what books I would recommend that they read. and. Uh, and honestly, it was a really good thing, and um, might be the only good thing I can think of that's come out of all this. Is there anything you're suggesting on Netflix, Governor? The, um, no, that would not be on my list. Um, the one thing I would recommend to anybody on Netflix is um, The Biggest Little Farm, which is uh, it's one of the best documentaries ever and it's magical, it's lyrical, and it's beautiful. Um, and it's only 90 minutes, so it's not like you have to watch 14 parts to get to the end. But it's about two people who lived in an apartment in Santa Monica, they got a dog from a, um, from a, uh, from a pound. Uh, they loved the dog, but every time they left the apartment to go to work, the dog would start barking, and it would bark until they came home. So they eventually got an eviction notice from their um, landlord, and they, it was either them or the, it was either the dog or they had to move. And at that point in time, they decided that they would go buy a, they would 
get a series of investors and go do something they'd always wanted to do, which was create a, natu a natural farm. And uh, it's awesome. I would highly recommend it to anybody. I could only watch a few episodes of Ozark before I decided if I kept watching it, I was going to have to jump off the roof of my house. <laughs> Which would be bad for my mental health, yeah. Well, first of all, as I said, we, we talk pretty regularly to our colleagues um, across the region. And, um, and Governor Mills is talking about a, a phased reopening. Um, and she's made very clear uh, in most of her commentary on this, I haven't seen all of it, uh, that they're going to do this in a careful and planful way. And, and I can't emphasize this enough. I mean, almost everybody who's talked about reopening is talking about doing it on a phased basis. And the, the way people choose to phase it varies a bit, but most people are looking to do things where they believe the most likelihood of people's ability to actually succeed in not creating uh, additional spread where the reopening is sort of, sort of first in line. And that typically means um, parts of your economy that don't have to deal with a lot of customers. Right? There's not a lot of face-to-face. -face. Parts of your economy where people can create the distancing because of the nature of the work that they do. Um, and I think you're going to see that be the approach that a lot of people take, which should limit, in many ways, some of the concerns about the cross-border stuff. I mean, one of the things we've talked a lot. Not, I'm sorry to interrupt, but they're talking about golf courses. I understand state parks, the barbershops, yeah. that kind of thing. I don't think anybody's going to drive from Massachusetts to Maine to go to a barbershop. Maybe they will. I don't know. But, um, well, golf is another thing where I think people, for the most part, Tend to tend to go local. Um, there are people I know who traveled from Massachusetts to other states in the region to golf, but they haven't gone to Maine. They've gone to other places. Governor, I'm uh, sure Walmart recently had to close because a number of their employees tested positive. I know the board is working on protocols for businesses in the future. Is anyone working on more stringent guidelines for businesses that are open right now? Well, we've put a whole series of guidance in place with respect to businesses that are currently open and. Um, and those guidances and advisories and, in some cases, orders remain in place until such time as they change. Um, I know you've talked to Eric about, um, about the Walmart. Do you have anything you want to say about that in particular? Uh, Eric Dixon is the CEO of Worcester Memorial. Right. So um, Walmart was uh, closed. Um, I think it was 40 of their employees, 41, of the, 41 employees. Uh, tested positive, and they made the decision to close Walmart for, and they have, they have like 400 employees. Um, the guidance that we generally put out is if someone tests, if someone tests positive, is to identify who their immediate contacts are, and then you identify the contacts as you know. If it's a broad contagion, um, some employers close and then do a, a disinfectant um, in order to reopen. Uh, so I don't know the details. We don't know the details of where the employees were working, but that was um, we're working with um, with UMass about whether to test all 400 employees before they reopen or not. It's, a, it's a, obviously a massive testing. Governor, could you speak to the reopening businesses? We've gotten some calls from florists concerned of whether or not they can do online orders. For example, many have been, but Winston Flowers was told they have to shut down if they plan to do this for Mother's Day. What is the We'll have more to say about that one before the, in plenty of time for Mother's Day. Governor, have you, spo uh, have you considered uh, using smartphone apps for contact tracing or uh, as one report from scientists to stop COVID-19 suggested for people to self-report COVID-19 uh, symptoms once we reopen? So um, the answer is yes. We have talked about this. And we've talked to a lot of the folks who have the apps. We've also talked to Google and, um, and Apple about, uh, about the way they're thinking about this. The question has to do with the whole idea of how, to, how, to, how does pinging phones, which obviously when Bluetooth is on in particular, uh, tells people where you are. Um, there are some confidentiality and privacy issues associated with this. 
Um, but that's an ongoing discussion that we're having with the folks that are involved in it. What I've said about this from the beginning is that I don't see this as an either or. Uh, if it can be done in a way that doesn't subtract from the importance of um, sort of the credibility of our tracing program, um, I think it's certainly something we should try and figure out uh, how to use if it can make it better. The thing I worry the most about is this whole tracing program is ultimately going to be based on trust, okay? And, and if you talk to some of the folks who are making these calls and talking to people on the other side, it is not a, con it is not a clinical conversation per se. It is a trust conversation. People ask questions. People are looking for information. It's a, it's a much more free-flowing and open dialogue than I think a lot of the people who are doing this were expecting. And so for us, that trust, that credibility issue is going to be really important for the success of this program. And, um, and that means if we incorporate something like the types of technology you're talking about into this, we're going to have to do it in a way that makes people comfortable that they're not, um, they're not giving up some of their privacy and confidentiality because we incorporated a, um, an electronic app into the process. Well, there's, I mean, there's two questions around testing. One is, um, what's the rate of infection, right? Um, I think that now on a three-day rolling average has been going down for a couple of weeks, hasn't it? Um, so even as we've been testing more and typically testing in places where we um, felt it was important for us to test, we've still see, seen, as I said in my remarks, a pretty decent sort of gradual trend down with respect to uh, the number of positives. Um, I think the, and we are talking to the medical advisory board that the command center has on what a sort of steady state level of testing should look like going forward. Um, I will say this, uh, if you look at Massachusetts current testing per capita um, and you measure it against sort of all the countries in the world, um, we're like a top five player. Um, and I think the, uh, the real challenge is not just how much you test, it's where you test and, um, and what your strategy is with respect to certain populations. So um, I think what you're going to see us work on while these folks are working on the reopening stuff is what would be the appropriate strategy with respect to who to test and how often to test and how much um, on a go-forward basis. Those questions are just as important. Yep. Are you confident that the additional PPE you're going to bring in will be higher quality than what's been brought in before? Well, keep in mind, a lot of the stuff we brought in tested plus 90 and plus 85. Uh, and part of the reason we tested all of it, yeah, and part of the reason we tested all of it was to figure out where it all landed. And anything that we bring in from this point forward, obviously, is going to get tested. That was the whole reason behind creating the program in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. Right now. And also to parents, um, what kind of, how much are you thinking of their concerns? And how are they going to get back to work if their kids are at school? Yeah, so two things. One is um, the reason we created a group that was small was because we wanted, rather than creating a group of 50 and then trying to wrangle 50 people to some place on a whole bunch of issues involving a variety of verticals and business models. Uh, and employer models, what we basically said is put together a group of pretty smart people that come from a variety of key sectors in Massachusetts, and then basically say to everybody else, talk within your community, figure out based on sort of broad guidelines and what you've heard from other parts of the country or other parts of the world, how people in your space have reopened and, and worked safely 
and then bring that one voice to our group and to talk to the advisory board about the way you would like to see um, your vertical, your business model open. And, um, and part of the reason why these guys are literally doing three, four, five hours a day of Zoom calls with different um, business verticals and, and business organizations and employers is to, to get that sort of consolidated, collaborative point of view from, um, from different folks who represent different interests. And so I'm sure the childcare community is on your short-term list. Yeah. Um, and the YMCA's in particular, uh, we've both talked about making sure that we talk to them because they've turned out to be pretty good at this. Um, the second thing I would say is that I think as of right now, we have about 10,000 available seats and um, I think we have about 2,500 people who are actually uh, on the ground and, and using those available seats. And it's certainly our view that, um, and remember, it's a phased opening. So it's not like, you know, it's not like you sort of raise your hand and everybody goes back to work on the same day in the same way that they did before. So as a phased opening, we would obviously want to see if we can figure out some way to ensure that the childcare community is working in sort of concert with what's going on generally with the increase in um, potential employment and the need for access. But as I said, we've got 10,000 seats and we've only got 2,500 in at this point. Governor, I've been hearing from I actually don't know. I mean, we set it up, we set it up with that level because we thought with the essential work community that we had out there that that would be the kind of number that people would be looking for. And for the most part, and we've talked a lot to folks in the healthcare space and in other essential work spaces that we have available capacity. Um, and it's, for one reason or another, it hasn't been accessed yet. Go ahead. When we. I know you got your hands full with all sorts of things, but uh, one of your signature initiatives, transportation climate initiative, is that pushed in the back burner, or are you still pushing ahead with it to try and come out with a memorandum soon? Uh, how do you feel about that right now? Well, I think, um, I think most things appropriately have been push to the back burner for the time being. Um, Secretary Sutters and I worked for almost a year to put together a health care bill um, that had a fair amount of momentum and a lot of positive response that would have dealt with a lot of important issues in Massachusetts around health care um, that obviously for the time being is sort of off the rack. And, uh, and I think that's going to be true for a lot of stuff. I mean, if we, if we can get to the point where and this is an if, where we, we create kind of the new normal that um, I think we're all hoping we get to. I'm hoping a bunch of things, not just uh, the health care bill, but housing choice. I mean, once upon a time, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about the fact that we don't have enough workforce affordable senior housing here in Massachusetts. Um, there's a bunch of things that have been sidetracked. and. Um, and I guess I would say appropriately so, given the size and significance and the sort of danger associated with the virus. But I'm hoping that a lot of that stuff will find a way back into the conversation um, at some point. But it's got to be after we get past what I would describe as, as sort of the, the middle of the, um, the circumstances associated with this. I, uh, it's one of the things on the reopening to-do list. It is. In fact, I sent the LG a note about the registry and some of the other services they offer today. Those are customer-facing services, though, so you've got to figure out a way to do that. And that's a close quarter, right? So you've got to figure out a way to do that that's going to be safe. I know, but the, but the 
driving test is not. So there's a driving yeah. test, but, the, but for the learner's permit. Yeah. Governor, the, um, you've mentioned we've hit a plateau, right? But um, there was a doctor who told us that uh, from MGH's Institute of Technology Assessment that uh, his model shows the state could actually see a peak of cases in ICU admissions in the next 10 days. I know you've mentioned models are models, but have you heard that possibility at all? Where does that fall on the spectrum of what's most likely versus what's not likely? Models are models are models, okay? And the great thing about being a modeler is nobody goes back to see if your model actually worked. Um, what I would say is what we've said before about this, which is um, this is a novel virus. It's not something that has history. It's not something that, um, you know, you can look at 5, 10, 8, 20, 50 years worth of data on and draw a lot of conclusions about how it's going to work. And, and, and just think about, in the past 40 or 50 days, how much information about what people once thought was true about this thing is not true anymore. I mean, my, the one I've talked about before when I've been here is um, in January-ish, people said uh, it takes three or four days, maybe five, before you actually start to show symptoms. So therefore, um, there are going to be some people who are going to look asymptomatic until they are symptomatic. And then toward the end of January, people start saying, you know, it might be there's 5% or so who's just never going to show symptoms. And then by the time you got into March, people were talking about, well, that might be as much as 10. And now people are saying that perhaps as much as 40% of the people who contract the virus and our carriers are, in fact, never going to show symptoms. And that's just in, you know, 60 days. So I think, the, I think the really hard part about this is predicting, um, is predicting much of anything that gets too far down the road beyond whatever your experience is. Now, our ICU numbers have, um, over the course of the past 15 days, kind of gone like this. You know, while the, the hospitalization numbers look kind of like an umbrella, you know, like this, um, the ICU numbers have gone like that. And, um, and the other thing I would say about the ICU numbers is there's a lot of people under the age of 60 in those ICU numbers, a lot. And I think sometimes um, people look at the awful and tragic death data and they think this is really only an issue for older people. But, you know, the Mass General and Brigham people have, and most of the other hospital folks will tell you that somewhere between 40 and 50 percent of all of their hospital days for COVID and their ICU days for COVID are people under the age of 60. So they do spend time in the hospital. With respect to the ICU piece, I, I mean, it's been, it's literally been like this, right? Yeah, a sawtooth. Better. Can I ask you about contact tracing very quickly, Governor? Governor Cuomo announced today, I think in conjunction with uh, Mike Bloomberg, that they're going to do contact tracing. Yeah. I know you say we're ahead of the curve on it. How's it going? Are, we, are you keeping track of, of whether it's successful? Well, the way you ultimately measure success on something like this is does it succeed in reducing um, the spread? Are you able to help the people who you're trying to isolate, isolate? And are you actually connecting with the people you're calling? And uh, and we're, I mean, we literally spent most of the month of, um, of April sort of standing this thing up. And, uh, and I would say that the early returns are good, but um, we have a long way to go here, and we'll have a lot more to say about it um, in the coming weeks. Are you finding people can isolate at home, or are people saying, hey, this is impossible for me to do? I need to go to an isolation center, and is there a plan in place for those? We, have, um, we do have hospital or, uh, hotel capacity available for people if they can't isolate at home. Yeah. Is it being used? Yeah. So um, this is the legislation we filed that would make it possible for us to issue revenue anticipation notes before the end of the fiscal year. The reason we want to issue revenue anticipation notes before the end of the fiscal year is we move the final tax filing um, to July 15th, 
um, and not April 15th. And the reason we moved the filing from April 15th to July 15th is we felt it would be a hardship for a lot of people to have to file their filing. Uh, and, and when you get closer to April 15th, not surprisingly, more people are paying at that point than getting refunds. I mean, a lot of the refunds come in and go out the door in January and February because people obviously who are going to get a refund usually file earlier. Um, I, we talked about trying to get this thing done by May 1st because that would be a good symbol and a good signal to send to the rating agencies that we would be in fact able to go into the markets, um, access the revenue in anticipation of um, all those tax filings in July and use that to close out the, the, calendar, or the fiscal year. Um, I, you know, I, I think it really needs to happen sometime in the month of May so that we have the month of June to actually execute on the, on the transaction and be in a position by the end of uh, June to say that we've, you know, done what we needed to do to deal with the transition associated with moving the final uh, tax filing from April to July. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.